All right. Well, good morning again. I got to admit, uh, I was this close to bringing the shoes that I got made fun of for. I didn't because I couldn't go through any more embarrassment, if I'm being honest. I saw... How, okay, just be honest. Just be honest. How many of you guys went home and you Googled Tom's? Like the shoe? No one? Good. So I managed to live to fight another day. Nobody, nobody went home and looked up my shoes that everybody at school gave me a hard time for wearing and at the Bell Fair. And honestly, everywhere, if I'm being honest, like I wore, I'll be honest, I wore them this past week for 4th of July and somebody else made fun of me for them. And then I had somebody who was like, you need to stop wearing those shoes. And I was like, you listen here, I'm going to do it anyway because I like the shoes. Sermon's over. Let's go. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm mostly kidding. So we have been looking at uh, fun in the sun, right? We've been going through some of the, the different teachings of Jesus, some of the words that he has for his followers, looking at his life, looking at his ministry, and, and seeing what we as Christians, as disciples of Christ, can take from his many different messages. And so we've, we've looked at a handful of different things. And if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, and I, I briefly brought it up last week, uh, we looked at the, the healing of the demon-possessed man, right? We, we looked at that. And today, as we get into things, we're going to see another very similar story emerge as we look at today's text. But before we really dive in, I wanted to start off with a, a, another little story from my, my childhood, uh, another story from just young little Richard growing up and... Uh, as many of you know, you, many of you, you've met my mom, uh, you know that she's like one of the sweetest people, you know that I did talk about how she would make fun of me for my shoes if I wore them to church on Sunday, um, so we, we did talk about that briefly, but for the most part, you guys know that she's a very sweet, you know, lady, and you know, she, she did her best to raise me in church and to raise me with morals, and for the most part, a lot of us as... Well, okay, not us, I'm not a parent, but many parents, they, they do a similar thing, right? You, you raise your child to have these different morals, and you try to set them on this, this path of, you know, what to say, what not to say, and for, for me, growing up, that was a huge portion of my life. Uh, growing up as a kid, I can't tell you how many times my mom would look me sternly in the eyes and say, you watch your words. You watch your words. So... Last week, when we were helping set up for, for VBS and getting some of the stuff ready, I talked about some of the things that I was uh, not allowed to say when I was a kid, right? And, and so there were a lot of words that I, I was not allowed to say, and I had to say uh, a different little filler word in order for it to be okay, right? So I'm going to say some words, Okay. I'm going to say some of those words, not the really bad ones, okay? I don't want you to think like your preacher is a dirty, dirty sinner for saying these words. Um, I'm going to say some words. They might not be the most churchy words, but for the record, the closed caption has not done a great job and has been forcing me to say some, some of the words. I found out that I said a word that was not very church appropriate like two weeks ago, and it put it on the closed captioning. I try to say, but hold, okay? But hold. That's what I try to say. Well, that's out there. So it did not say that. Um, I did not say that, but I'm going to say it now, okay? So I was not allowed to say the word but, okay? I wasn't allowed to say it. I had to say rear end. Um, I had to say rear end. I don't even think I was allowed to say Heine. My mom might fly up here to correct me on that. But I, I had to say rear end. I was very specifically told you don't say that word, right? I would say it. You watch your words. So it got to the point, right, that this was ingrained in me so deeply. Another word that I was not allowed to say, two words technically, shut up. I could not say that. That was a naughty word. That was a potty word. We don't say shut up. 
So fast forward, I believe I was probably like five or six. My grandma, my dear, sweet old grandma, she was talking to somebody in my family, and they were cracking jokes. It was probably one of my uncles because that's the way that my uncles are. And my grandma said, shut up. How dare she? That's not going to fly with me. So I looked at my grandma and I said, Grandma, we don't say shut up. My grandma said, Grandma says shut up. (laughs) But that's the way that I was raised. Like, I was just raised, right, that like, I don't say these words. And for the most part, like, a lot of you, you might have very similar situations with, with, uh, you know, children or grandchildren, right? Where your, your child or your grandchild might be like, we don't say that word. And you might be like, I say that word. But, you know, for the most part, I was always told, watch your words. Now, Today, as we get into the scriptures and as we, we look at uh, what Jesus continues to teach his disciples, he's going to say something very similar to his disciples, to those who are following him. Now, in order to, to preface this, we have to look at the context. So, in the, we're going to be in Matthew. We're going to be looking at chapter 12. So we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 12, and there's, there's some narratives that unfold, and one of these, these narratives that unfolds is yet another demon-possessed person who comes to Jesus for healing, or I don't know if he really comes for healing, but he comes to Jesus, yet again he just shows up, and Jesus removes the demonic spirit from this person, and once again... Jesus is accused of casting out demons through the power of the ruler of the demons, right? So that is what happens yet again. And as Jesus starts talking to these people, this this thing that he says gets a little longer than the last time he had to deal with this issue. And this is where we we see Abraham Lincoln, and he starts to, to steal from Jesus a little bit when he says, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand I'll bring it back. That's what Jesus says here. For the record, Abraham Lincoln didn't even give Jesus credit for that in in his speech. I read it yesterday. Anyway, so Jesus says that. Jesus says, how could I be casting out demons through the power of the prince of demons? How could I do this? Because a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. A kingdom that is divided will fall. How could I be doing things that are against the kingdom of evil by the power of the kingdom of evil? Like, how could I be doing that? And so... That's the issue that Jesus is dealing with when we get to the portion that we're going to read today. Now, one of the things that Jesus concludes with is this. Uh, In verse 31, we don't have to to put it up yet. I don't have it. But this is what Jesus says in verse 31. We're going to be looking at verse 33. But this is kind of the, the preface to what he says in verse 33. Verse 31, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, People will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the, the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the one to come. Now, admittedly, I didn't really want to focus on this aspect, but it, it's impossible for me to deal with the text that we're going to be looking at without looking at this portion first. And on top of that, I wanted to deal with this really quickly because here's what happens, okay? So as a church pastor, this is what happens virtually every time a, a believer comes across this, this passage here, right? So people, they, Christians, you know, they like to take it upon themselves. They're going to read through the book in a year, you know, the whole Bible in one year. They're going to go through the New Testament in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whatever. And here's what ends up happening many, many times in the life of Christians in, in general. They come across this passage, right, where Jesus says that people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy except for blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Right, and Jesus says, this will not be forgiven. Here's what happens probably nine times out of ten. 
pastor gets a call. Hey, I just read this. Jesus said that if I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, I, I can't be forgiven. How do I know if I've done that? That's what Jesus says. He says that if I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that means that, that I can't be forgiven and I want to be forgiven. So I, I need you as, as pastor, fill in the blank, to, to help me feel better. Make sure, please tell me, did I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Like, what if I did it on accident? What if I didn't realize that I did it? Am I not going to be forgiven? And I want to give you a very quick sentence to maybe bring some peace. Real quick. If you are worried as to whether or not you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you probably haven't. If you're worried that you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you probably haven't. The context lines up what the Holy Spirit and what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. Right? So these people, they are attributing the works of Jesus to the works of Satan. That's what they're doing. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is probably something very similar where you're looking at the works of the Holy Spirit and you would then say that the work of the Spirit is actually hell-bent and is actually Satan-delivered. But to take it a little bit further, um, while I was researching this and trying to look into giving you guys some guidance on this, I, I came across a quote, and it's by a, a professor of uh, New Testament and theology and stuff uh, from Biola University. Now, Biola University is a very prestigious college out in the West Coast. Believe it or not, they exist. There are prestigious Christian universities out on the West Coast in California. They do exist. Um, they are conservative, right? So this is not like some crazy, like, out there theology that might be existing, um, we're just going to throw it out there. So this is what was said. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is not simply saying something bad about the Holy Spirit or about anything else for that matter, but it is a persistent rejection of the convicting work of the Spirit whose job it is to expose our sin and lead us to accept Christ. So that's what, what Kenneth Birding wrote. Uh, he works at the Talbot School of Theology, which is associated with Biola University. He teaches New Testament and theology in very similar classes. So again, I just want to put it out there that maybe as we've gone through some of this, this passage and you're like, well, have I done that? If you're asking that question, you probably haven't. If you are being convicted, right? If you are feeling convicted that you might have sinned, that means that you're probably not pushing away the spirit that brings you that conviction. If you're truly worried and you truly want to repent of it, then you're probably not pushing away the spirit that causes you to do so, right? And so this really very heavily leads into what I did want to focus on. Now, the, the passage that I really want us to deal with is Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. If we can go ahead and put that up. This is what Jesus says, and he's continuing the argument that he's already been making about the house being divided and about blasphemy of the Spirit and saying bad things about the Son of Man. That's what he's talking about, right? And he moves into this. Verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers. That's the Pharisees. How can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. A good person produces good things from his storeroom of good. And an evil person produces evil things from his storeroom of evil. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word that they speak. For by your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. That's the passage that I really want us to, to look at today. The reason that I wanted to preface this with the context is here's what is very easy to have happen when you just read this passage and you just take it at its face value. It's very easy, especially in an American context, to read this passage 
and say, you can't say bad words. You can't say, you can't say but. You can't say, shut up. You can't say this bad word or that bad word. That's not what the passage is dealing with. Now, I want to preface this by saying, I'm not out here saying, like, you know, be running around the church is like going willy-nilly. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't necessarily need that. That's a passage for a different time. We can look at that issue on its own a different time when we look at a different passage of the Bible. We can deal with that then. What I want to deal with when we look at this passage is this fruit and this tree idea. And this whole brood of vipers, remember, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. And he's getting to the root of the issue that they are saying evil things because they have evil things in their heart. Because they have wicked things in their heart, they are saying these wicked things about Jesus, but also about the Holy Spirit and the power through which Jesus is operating. That is the preface for this discussion. Now then, now that that has been established, I, I, I was digging into the Greek. I was looking into the, the text in the original language that the, the New Testament was written in. And I was looking, and I, I find, as many of you know, I read from the CSB a lot. That's the translation that we go through. I like the translation, but when I was kind of studying this on my own, there were some certain things where I was like, Eh, I feel like they probably could have done something a little bit better. Um, so, for example, with the fruit being bad, that's not really the, the proper word. Uh, it's a word that, that would work, but the word really means rotten. Right? So it's not just that the, the fruit is just kind of bad. It's not like, oh, man, the apple's been bruised. Now I can't eat it. This is like rotten to the core. And I want to really emphasize that because that's what Jesus is saying is that bad, rotten trees produce bad, rotten fruit. And so if you are a good tree, the fruit that you produce is going to be good. It might be a little bruised. It might be a little banged up. But it is not rotten to the core. He says that from the mouth, uh, for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. That which is hidden in the heart, what it is filled with, is what the mouth produces. That's what that word overflow means. Whatever the heart has been filled with, that is what your mouth is going to speak. So we're, we're looking at good versus rotten fruit good versus rotten trees, and then he makes it a heart issue, and he says, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And the final little piece to this puzzle that I really want us to look at, Jesus says in verse 36 and verse 37, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. I've really been debating how I feel about that word careless, as to whether or not I I feel like it's a decently accurate uh, translation, and I've, I've gone back and forth pretty consistently the word that they use there in the Greek is the word argon. Now, if you love chemistry for some reason and you're nerdy like me, that, that word argon might ring a bell. There's an element on the periodic table called argon. They took that name from this Greek word. And it, do you know what that word literally translates to? Lazy. It literally translates to lazy, inactive, doesn't do anything. 
And so when they, when they named the element that, it's because the element typically doesn't have very many chemical reactions. But when we're talking about our, our mouth, when we're talking about the words that we say, what would be a lazy word? What is a lazy word? And I think this is where they, they get this word careless for. What if a lazy word is something that you don't think about? You ever been told that? Think before you speak. Think before you speak. Don't be lazy about the words that you use. Be thoughtful of what you are about to say before you say it. And I think that is what Jesus is talking about here. Because, again, these Pharisees, they're seeing one thing, and then they're just jumping to conclusions without truly thinking through what they're saying. And Jesus is trying to get everybody to recognize that what they're saying is wrong, what they're saying is blasphemous, what they're saying is sinful. And he's trying to get them to think about what they say before they say it. There's an old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt or bruise or whatever word you choose to put there, me. I think many of us know that that's not entirely true. I think we, I think we say that phrase, one, because it's catchy and it kind of rhymes and stuff, but I think we also say it to try to put this mask on that we're somehow unbothered by what people say. Jesus wasn't unbothered by what people say. He was pretty upset at what they said. That's why he says this. The reality is, is that Jesus calls us to be very careful with what we say. Now, I'm not going to, again, the whole cuss word thing, stubbing your toe and letting out, you know, a word that is four letters long, that's an issue that we can deal with another time. I really want to talk about the heart stuff. I really want to talk about the, the stuff that our heart is filled with, that comes out of our mouth. Because I think sometimes we, we think that we can get away with saying things as Christians because it's not one of those four-letter long words. But I think that if Jesus were really going to challenge us here, he's telling us to look at our hearts and the things that we say because of what our hearts feel, right? Because if your heart is filled with hatred and is filled with anger, then the things of which you speak are going to flow from those dark, deep places. Now, growing up, uh, I, I played a lot of video games. Many of you guys know that. I played a lot of Call of Duty, right? And so Call of Duty is one of those games where, like, you go on, you put your headset on, and you, you, you yell at kids, and you make 12-year-olds feel bad about their life, even though you're a 30-year-old grown man. Um, but when I was growing up and I was playing, there was a really common thing that would, would be said when I was playing this game, right? And so I got to admit, some of these are not my proudest moments, okay? So moving forward, this is not like I'm a saint, they're all sinners. This is like Call of Duty is a God-forsaken place, okay? So we would be playing this game. You'd get shot. You would die. Your team would lose. Someone would say something like, oh, you're terrible at this game, but they wouldn't say that. They'd say other words that have the four letters, you know. And growing up, it was very common to just be like, hey, kill yourself. Kill yourself? That's not a very good, uh, good message for someone. And it's easy to sit there and, and look at it and just be like, ah, that's just call of duty, man. That's just, that's the culture right? That's, that's what we say to each other. We don't actually want them to. But what if, what if they did? When you're online, let's just be honest. Many of you, you have Facebook. Many of you, you've seen the stuff. When you go online, 
People can say all kinds of wild things that for the most part, they're not going to say to someone's face. And a lot of it comes from deep parts of our hearts, right? We're, we're passionate about something, or we, we truly believe this one thing, or we truly feel this way, and so we, we just have to go online into the comment section and tell them how ugly their dress is. And we have to go on there, and we, we have to say this, and I know that an ugly dress is not like, that's not the same as telling someone to kill themselves, right? Like, let's just be honest. But... I think if we're being honest, we find ourselves in positions where we say things because of what is truly in our hearts. You ever been cut off in traffic? You ever said something? Yeah, <laughs> me too. Let's just be real. <laughs> like, we all have these things. And Jesus is saying, check your heart. Check your heart. Now, I already brought up the, the nerdy stuff of, of chemistry and talked about chemicals and chemistry and elements and stuff, and, and stuff not stuff. I had to see what it was going to say for a word that doesn't exist. Anyway, so I already talked about that. The last verse, I want to put this as a scientific hypothesis. Jesus says, for by your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. I want to put this as a scientific hypothesis, and I know that school hasn't started, and so I apologize to, to the students who are like, please, please don't, but I'm going to deal with it. It's one Sunday out of, like, three months. The hypothesis thing when it comes to scientific theory is if, then, because, right? That is, that is the, the hypothesis formula is if this, then this, because this. So the hypothesis that I want us to think about, and this is kind of, kind of to wrap things up. Here's what I want you to think. If Jesus is right about what he said, if Jesus is right, which I know is a crazy thing to say in church, like, what do you mean, if Jesus is right? Jesus is Jesus. He's right. But again, this is just a hypothesis. If Jesus is right about what he said, then I will be acquitted or condemned. I will be passed over. I will be forgiven. I will be whatever it may be. Or I will be condemned because... I have said this or done that. I've said this. I've done that. I've told someone to this. I've told someone to that because my heart is this or that. I think if we're all being honest, we really need to do a heart check. There's nothing wrong with that, right? You take your car in for an oil change. You take your car into, you know, you change your spark plugs, and sometimes some of us not as frequently as we should, but, you know, my bad. We all have maintenance, right? There's, there's things that we can do to, to check our, our engines in our car. Why would we not check the engine that runs us? Sometimes we have to just make sure that everything is all good under the hood. I think if we're being honest, sometimes we're just, we're not as consistent as we should be. We let those oil changes run a little too long. We go a little too long without, you know, rotating tires, and we, we don't maintain our hearts, and we don't maintain our lives as frequently as we should. We get into the, into the process of thinking, like, everything's fine, and you don't realize that the check engine light's been on the whole time. I'm just going to throw it out there. If you start saying certain things, especially to other people, things that are, are hateful, if, you, if you're constantly saying, I hate you, I can't stand you, I hate this person, if you're playing Call of Duty, you're telling people to kill themselves, that might be a warning sign that the check engine light's on. 
and especially if other people see it, right? Like, as Christians, we're called to be the light, right? Like, we're, we're called to shine a bright light into a dark world. How can we do that if the message and the words that we speak are not bright and they're not edifying to what God has in store for people? If God calls us to love people, how can we say, I hate you or I hate them? And so if other people are, are seeing some of the things, it might be a sign that the check engine light's on. And so the final point is this, and the wise words of my mom, watch your words. Watch your words, and it's not just because words are bad, but because sometimes it reveals that there's an underlying heart issue. Watch your words. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I thank you for your son. I thank you for his many messages that we can draw from. God, I thank you that you forgive. God, I thank you that even when we make mistake after mistake, God, that if we would just turn to you, repent, and allow your, your spirit to guide us, God, that you are willing to forgive because of what your son did all those years ago. God, I pray that as we, as we leave from here, as we interact with the people around us, I pray that we would just watch the words that we speak. God, that we would, we would watch what we say, how we say it to other people. And God, that if, if it starts to, to look like there might be some hatred, some anger, God, that we would be willing to, to examine our hearts, to look deep within ourselves and start to do some of the hard work of seeing where some of that, that speech is coming from. God, we love you and we thank you. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. As per usual, this will be the time of invitation. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, any praises that you would like to lift up, uh, any decisions that you would like to make, this will be the time to do so as the band comes and leads us in one final song.